So I take that seriously, the idea that we're a loose collection of spirits. And that, that, uh, that, that you know, it says in the Old Testament somewhere that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And I think this is akin to that. If you know that you're not in control of yourself thoroughly and that there are other factors behind the scenes, like the Greeks thought that human beings were the playthings of the gods. That's the way they conceptualized the world. And they sort of meant the same thing. They meant that there are these great forces that that move us, that we don't create, that we're, that, we're, that we're subordinate to in some sense. Not entirely, but we can be subordinate to them, and they move our destinies. That was the Greek view, and there's something, it, 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 it teaches you humility to understand that, that, that there's a hell of a lot more going on behind the scenes, and you're, you're the driver of a very complex vehicle, but you don't understand the vehicle very well, and it's got its own motivations and methods and sometimes you think it's doing something and it's doing something completely completely different you see that in psychotherapy all the time because you know you help someone unwind a pattern of behavior that they've manifested forever first of all they describe it then they become aware of it then maybe they start to see what the cause is they had no idea why they were acting like that you know they have to have the memory that produced the the, the behavioral pattern to begin with it has to be brought back to mind, and then it has to be analyzed and assessed, and then they have to think about a different way of acting, and it's extraordinarily complex. So, psychoanalytic, literary. Well, there's this new, there's this postmodern idea about literature, and about the world, for that matter, that if you take a complex piece of literature, like, like a Shakespeare play, there's no end to the number of interpretations that you can make of it. You know, you can interpret each word, you can interpret each phrase, each sentence, each paragraph, you can interpret the entire play. The way you interpret it depends on how many other books you've read, depends on your orientation in the world. It, it, it depends on a very, very large number of things, how cultured you are or how, how much culture you lack. All of those things, it, it opens up a huge a huge vista for potential interpretation. And so the postmodernists sort of stubbed their toe on that and thought, well, if there's this vast number of interpretations of any particular literary work, how can you be sure that any interpretation is more valid than any other interpretation? And if you can't be sure, then how do you even know those are great works? How do you know they can't? Maybe they're just works that the people in power have used to facilitate their continual accession of power, which is really a postmodern idea and a very very cynical one but it has its point but the thing is it's grounded in something real right it's like yes you can interpret things forever I want to show you something here just briefly we'll go back to it later look at this this is the cool one of the coolest things I've ever seen so at the bottom here every single one of those lines is a biblical verse okay now the length of the line is proportionate to how many times that verse is referred to in some way by some other verse. So you say, well, this is the first hyperlinked book. Right? I'm, I'm dead serious about that. It, like, that you can't click and get the hyperlinks, obviously, but it's a thoroughly hyperlinked book. And it's because, well, the people who worked on these stories that are hypothetically at the end, right, which is the end can't affect the beginning. That's, that's the rule of time, right? What happens now can't affect what happened to you 10 years ago even though it actually can, but whatever. <laughs> well, you reinterpret things, right, and then they're not the same, but whatever, we won't get into that. But technically speaking, the present cannot affect the past, but if you were looking at a piece of literature, that's not right, because when you write the end, you know what was at the beginning, and when you write the beginning, or edit it, you know what's at the end. And so you can weave the whole thing together. And there's 65,000 cross-references, and that's what this map shows. And so that's a great visual representation of the book. And then you can see, well, why is it deep? Why is the book deep? Well, just imagine how many pathways you could take through that, right? I mean, you'd just journey through, you'd just journey through that forever. You'd never, ever get to the end of it. There's permutations and combinations, and every phrase is dependent on every other phrase, and every verse is dependent on every other, not, not entirely, but 65,000 is not a bad start. And so, okay, well, so... So that, that, that's another issue, in some sense, that seems to make the postmodernist critique even more correct. How in the world are you going to extract out a canonical interpretation of something like that? It's like it's not possible. But here's the issue, as far as I can tell. 
The interpret so when the postmodernists extended that critique to the world, they said, look, while well, a text is complicated enough, you can't extract out a canonical interpretation. What about the world? The world's way more complicated than a text, and so there's an infinite number of ways that you can look at the world. And so how do we know that any one way is better than any other way? And that's a good question. Now, the postmodern answer was, we can't. And that's not a good answer, because you drown in chaos under those circumstances, right? You can't make sense of anything. And that's not good, because it's not neutral to not make sense of things. It's very anxiety-provoking. It's very depressing, because if things are so chaotic that you can't get a handle on them, your body defaults into emergency preparation mode, and your heart rate goes up, and your immune system stops working, and like you burn yourself out, you age rapidly, because you're surrounded by nothing you can control. It's very, that's an existential crisis, right? It's anxiety-provoking and depressing, very hard on people. And even more than that, it turns out that the way that we're constructed neurophysiologically is that we don't experience any positive emotion unless we have an aim and we can see ourselves progressing towards that aim. It isn't precisely attaining the aim that makes us happy. As you all know, if you've ever attained anything, because as soon as you attain it, then the whole little game ends, then you have to come up with another game, right? So it's, it's Sisyphus. And that, that's okay, but, but it does show that the attainment can't be the thing that drives you because it collapses the game. That's what happens when you graduate from university. It's like, you're king of the mountain for one day, and then you're like surf at, 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 at Starbucks for the next five years, you know? So, yeah. So what happens is that, that human beings are weird creatures because we're much more activated by having an aim and moving towards it than we are by attainment. And what that means is you have to have an aim. And that means you have to have an interpretation. And it also means that the nobler the aim, that's one way of thinking about it, the better your life. And that's a really interesting thing to know because, you know, you've heard ever since you were tiny that you should act like a good person. and You shouldn't lie, for example. And you might think, well, wh why the hell should I act like a good person and why not lie? I mean, even a three-year-old can ask that question, because smart, smart kids learn to lie earlier, by the way. And they, they think, well, why not twist the fabric of reality so that it serves your specific short-term needs? I mean, that's a great question. Why not do that? Why act morally? If you can get away with something, and it, it brings you closer to something you want, well, why not do it? These are good questions. It's not self-evident. Well, it seems to me tied in with what I just mentioned. It's like, you destabilize yourself and things become chaotic, that's not good. And if you don't have a noble aim, then you have nothing but, but shallow, trivial pleasures. And they don't sustain you. And that's not good because, because life is so difficult, so much, it's so much suffering, it's so complex. It ends and everyone dies and it's painful. It's like without a noble aim, how can you withstand any of that? You can't. You become desperate, and once you become desperate, things go, things go from bad to worse very rapidly when you become desperate. And so there's the idea of the noble aim, and it's, it's not something, it's, it's something that's necessary. It's the bread that people cannot live without, right? That's not physical bread. It's the noble aim. And what is that? Well, it was encapsulated in part in the story of Marduk. That's, that's, it's to pay attention. It's to speak properly. It's to confront chaos. It's to make a better world. It's something like that. And that's enough of a noble aim so that you can stand up without, you know, cringing at the very thought of your own existence so that you can do something that's worthwhile to justify your wretched position on the planet.